Welcome to the Connect Your Health to Life coaching podcast. I'm your host, Seth Lusk. I'm a master certified life coach and published author with a decade long background working in the health, wellness, and fitness industry as a personal trainer, nutrition specialist, and life coach. If you're anything like me or the clients that I work with, then you might be struggling with some confidence issues or struggling with feeling like you're not living your most fulfilling or authentic life. You may be trying to figure out why you have these amazing desires for what your most fulfilling life would look like, but you can't seem to create consistent action in your life to reflect those desires. So join me as we dive in deep on what it means to truly live a fulfilled and authentic life from the inside out. We're going to look from the perspective of an empowered mindset and uncover some of the reasons why you might be what's holding yourself back from living that most fulfilling life. But don't worry, this isn't about blame, guilt, or shame. This is about empowering you to see. I'm going to break through some of the biggest illusions and myths that we've all been taught to believe along the way, and I'm so excited to have you with me on this journey. So my only question for you is, are you ready to start living your most fulfilling life once and for all? Then let's get started, shall we? Hey everyone, welcome back to the podcast. For those of you listening in for the first time, welcome, welcome. You picked um, a fascinating episode. However, if this is your first time listening, this is a second part to a three-part series. So I'm going to ask that even though this episode is super interesting and going to be very helpful for you, that you go back and listen to the episode, um, the previous episode from last week before continuing on with this episode, because this episode is the second part in a three-part series. So you're going to want to listen to the first episode first so that this episode makes sense, and then you'll want to listen to this one first before next week's episode comes out for it to make sense. So three-part series, we're on part two today. And if you remember from last week what we talked about, we're talking about authenticity in health and what that means. And when we talk about authenticity and help, you know, what authenticity is, is basically something that has an indisputable origin. It's not a copy. It's not a replication of something else. And we talked a little bit last week about what it means when people or what it looks like in people's lives when they're being inauthentic with their health choices. So that people, you can begin to recognize Um, whether or not you're being authentic with your choices for your health. Um, And I would say that the majority of people out there, unless you've already been coached on this, are probably making inauthentic goals for your health. So it's really important for you to take the time to listen to these episodes so you can really take an honest look at the choices that you're making about goals for your health and really decide for yourself, are these goals that I have for me or are these goals that I feel like I should have for me or these goals that were passed on because of, uh, you know, social pressure or um, social programming, which, you know, we can't get rid of all social programming, but we can get as close to authenticity as possible. We talked a little bit about what authenticity would actually mean in this area of your life. And basically what it means is being able to take your health goals and bring them back to your authentic purpose, value, sensitivities, and goals, in, or not goals in life, your your mission in life. So this week, we're going to talk about something a little bit different. We're basically going to talk this week about what it would even start to look like if a person makes choices that are authentic for them when it comes to their health. And I'm here to tell you this after working with people on their health goals for over a, over a decade now. And... Over this time of working with people on their health goals, something really kind of started to stand out to me that I didn't expect when I first started on my journey of out of college and wanting to help people and figuring out my way of how I'm going to help people in an authentic way, which eventually led me here to life coaching. But in the beginning, I was a personal trainer and nutrition specialist. Last week's episode, I kind of explained all of that to you all and how that happened and how I ended up as a life coach. And I explained to you a little bit about my backstory and some of my goals that I had that were inauthentic when it comes to health. This week, I'm going to talk to you all about how I sort of began to transition those into authentic goals. But what I want to say is that after this decade or over a decade of working with people on, you know, exercise programs, nutrition programs, goals for, you know, anything relating to their health when it comes to weight loss, when it comes to... Um, I, I even helped clients with, um, you know, getting off of medication for blood pressure, for, uh, getting off of insulin, for getting off of anti-inflammatory medication. So being able to get their hormones under control. So, so many different ways that people have come to me for health goals, but here's what I noticed. 
even though I've been doing this for over a decade and I've had so many people come to me with how they said it, they were like the same exact goals. I want this. I want that. And these people were telling me the same exact goals as someone else or, or very similar to what someone else had that, this, that I've already worked with. And here's what I noticed. No two people's programs that I put together for them when it comes to nutrition, when it comes to exercise, when it comes to how they're going to work on their sleeping patterns, how they're going to work on taking care of their hormones, their stress relief, um, stress release, how they're going to work on taking care of their mental health uh, as far as their maybe their anxiety or, or maybe struggles with depression. So no two people's programs that I put together were the same. Even if the goals were supposedly the same, there was always like a certain amount of variability and customization to these programs. Even if two people came to me with similar goals that, you know, to the to the average eye would seem like they're similar people as far as where they are with their health and taking care of their health, their programs would always have variability. Now, why am I telling you this? Because what this tells me is that our health is not to be cared for the same way as anyone else's, okay, my friends? The way that we take care of our health is as authentic to us as we are as a person, as a biological organism, as uniquely different as our fingerprints are, as our exact genetic makeup is, which allows for CSI agents, you know, crime scene investigation agents, to be able to find DNA at a crime scene and trace it back to a single person because no two people on this planet share the same exact DNA or the same exact fingerprints. So what that is to say is that our current approach, which is a lot of times dealing with, you know, wanting to look for someone else's quick fix how-to guide to make changes in our health, It's not serving us because our health is not to be cared for in the same way as anyone else's. What this also tells me is that our goals for our health are also allowed to be as unique and authentic as the ways that we will get there. And I want to look at today what it would mean or even look like then if we begin making these sort of authentic decisions and goals for our health in a way that is as unique and authentic as we are as individuals. So as previously mentioned, when we talk about authenticity, what we mean is something that is of undisputed origin and that is not a copy or a replication of something else. Yet, what I see with most people when making goals for their health is that they're looking to, say, a magazine, social media, some articles that they read in a newspaper or online and on a, on a blog from another person or from some standard that was taught to them by a teacher, a parent, or some adult figure when they were a child or a teenager or even as a young adult when they looked up to another adult. And they look to the opinions of their friends to tell them their goals and their decisions for their health and what they should be. And none of this is a non-copied version of a decision. The origins of these decisions and goals is not undisputed, and it is a copy, because these standards come from ideas and beliefs rooted in shame and guilt and people-pleasing and this idea that we need to prove our worth and that we need to get external validation in order to prove that we're being good enough people or that we are good enough or that we're worthy enough. And these ideas and beliefs have been passed on and internalized over and over by people from generation to generation without any consideration of true desire. And true desire, if you remember, is rooted in purpose. It is rooted in values and sensitivities. And these, my friends, are authentic from individual to individual. They're not the same. I have been working with people on mapping out purpose and values and sensitivities for quite some time now, and what I'm here to tell you is that even when sometimes the the, the quote-unquote the list of values, because usually I have people narrow it down to about five to seven main core values, even sometimes the clients will have very similar lists or maybe even identical lists. But here's the thing. These words are merely an expression of something that is actually inexpressible by human language. So even if the words that they choose to describe those values for them 
are the same as someone else's list, the way they relate to those words, what those words mean to that person, what they feel when they hear and say these words is entirely different. So no two people's system of values and purpose in life are the same. I am here to tell you that, my friends. And I, you know, I've been, like I said, I've been doing this for quite a while. I have yet to run into two people that have the same exact list of values and have the same connection to those words of values. And if you don't believe me, we can try it out. (laughs) We can try it out together. Let's, let's work together. I have, I have plenty of ways that we could do this. So, but what I need you to grasp from today is that true desire is something that is rooted in something that is very authentic from person to person. And authentic decisions are therefore rooted in this. And this includes decisions about our health. And this is not a message that is often portrayed by media when it comes to caring for our health. Media plays into this idea that we we have these quick fix, one size fits all solutions that we can all just kind of do. And if it doesn't work for you, well, then you're probably not doing it right. Or there's something wrong with you. And also the media plays into this desire that humans think that they have for that one-size-fits-all how-to solution. And the reason why we think we want that is that our brains do not like to think. I know that you're like, what? Hold on. Isn't that what the brain does? Okay. There are two different ways that our brains kind of think. And there's a book out there that's a really great book if you want to want to check it out. It's called Thinking Fast and Slow. And in this book, they talk about um, the, the two different parts of the brain. The part of the brain that is capable of higher thinking, it takes a lot of energy and it's slower when it comes to thinking, but it makes a lot more uh, higher quality thoughts and observations and analyzations. And then we have the second part of the brain, which is what I call the lizard part of the brain, which is the very fast kind of automated, almost subconscious part of the brain. Oftentimes we don't even realize what that part of the brain is doing because it's doing it so quickly and so efficiently that we don't recognize what's actually going on there. And here's the thing. Our brain likes to get processes to that quick part of the brain as fast as possible to conserve energy. And what this translates into is the fact that our brains seem to want to fight us on thinking about solutions. So we have this we have this urge almost to reach for these one size fits all quick fix solutions out there that someone else did and says, oh, this is foolproof. Anyone can do it. It's going to work for you. And then we want to reach for those solutions because we also want that certainty that the brain is looking for because it thinks that means safety and therefore life. But our brains also don't want to think. But also, if you remember me telling you for the last 87 episodes, because we're on episode 88 today, and I've said it over 100 times, I'm sure by now, the brain is a tool that we get to use. But when we don't choose to use it with intention and for a purpose that we see clearly, then the brain will use us to achieve what it has biologically evolved and hardwired itself to do. No matter how ineffective or helpful that process might be in getting us closer to what our higher self wants out of this life and what, how we actually want to be living. And this means that the brain will use us to avoid uncertainty. It will u- use us to avoid thinking about situations and making decisions about what we want to do. And this is because the brain, my friends, is a massive energy-using organ, okay? And the brain knows this. Some of us don't recognize this. And so let me let me just give you a little bit of a, a thought here. I just want you to begin to think about this. So we have over 200 muscles in the body, okay? And each and every one of these muscles are using ATP throughout the day to hold bones in place, to make movements with the body, to also we have muscles inside of our organs that are constantly processing food or pumping blood or moving oxygen to certain places or moving nutrients to certain places or processing nutrients or creating hormones. Or cre- We have all of these things going on in the body, all of our organs, all of our muscles, all of our tissue in the body that requires energy to stay alive. Skin, you know, um, everything, every tissue, living tissue in our body requires energy to stay alive. Our bones require energy to stay alive. So here's what's crazy. 
Out of all of those things that we have in our body that are asking for energy in order for our bodies to be able to move, to animate, to take in nutrients, to make nutrients, to stay alive, to function properly, out of all of those those bits and pieces throughout our body, did you know that the brain, this one single organ in the body, uses around 30% of our total energy expenditure for the day? Think about that. This one organ is a massive energy consumer. Okay, it makes up maybe about what, like 10, 5 to 10 percent of our total body weight, but it takes up about 30 percent of the total energy that we expend throughout the day. So this organ uses a lot of energy. And here's the other thing, the part of the brain that thinks slowly and consciously and intentionally and analyzes with clarity and with a higher quality is the part of the brain that uses more energy, okay? So the brain knows this. It also knows that its primary function is to keep us alive. So to it, because it still thinks, oh, energy scarcity, and oh, we might starve to death even though we have food available to us 24-7. We're not anywhere near starving. Your brain thinks that conserving energy wherever it can and being efficient in conserving energy wherever it can is a way for it to help keep you alive. So avoiding thinking in an intentional, conscious, higher quality way to the brain is a way to conserve energy and therefore increase chances of survival. Remember this. Your brain is hardwired to take the quote-unquote lazy or more energy efficient route. This is what it has biologically evolved to do. So this urge to resist thinking about things or to want to analyze things, it's not because something is wrong with you. Remember, you are the being that has the brain. The brain is not you, okay? That is just a tool that you get to use. That's not you. So there's nothing wrong with you. And there's, it's not that there is somehow something defective about you that you feel the urge to not want to process or think about things with intention. It also doesn't mean that this urge is serving you in your most authentic way. What it means is that you have a brain that has evolved to do what it has evolved to do. But here's what I see. I see people falling into one of two camps with this and how they view this. Either the urge means that something is wrong with them and their brain and there is, you know, they they need to like, I don't know feel shameful and, you know, eat themselves to comfort because there's something, something is so broken about them that they've, that they're lazy and broken, whatever. Or the other camp is that there is nothing wrong with them and their brain. And what that means is that when this urge comes up, it's something that they should follow because it's there. And so that means we should do it. Just whatever the brain says we should do. But neither of these is the entire truth because what this actually means is that you are a being with a brain that has evolved to do exactly what it was supposed to do according to what the brain learned about survival in our past, okay? But this same wiring, this same strategy no longer serves us at this step in our growth and evolution or in the current environment in which we are living and evolving. The environment in which we have so rapidly created for us as humans to be able to live in. It's it's so far removed from nature or reality that the brain's biological wiring that is in tune with nature and reality, or at least what it used to be, that wiring is causing us quite a bit of dysfunction in how we show up in our modern world and in the modern environment that we have created for us to live in. And so many of us are living in this model of guilt and shame that we don't understand what is actually happening here. There's nothing wrong with us. We just have a brain that has evolved to do exactly what it's supposed to do. But we also forget we're the human being that's in charge of that brain. And we're not being taught to look at it this way. We're not being taught how to use our brain and its biological wiring in a way that can serve us now instead of trying to fight it, resist it, or just give into it and act like animals. Or act like we have no ability to to use the brain other than for whatever urge it happens to throw out. And what, what this means is that we really want to start paying close attention here. What we want to do is remember our own role when it comes to being a human that has a properly evolved brain. And what that properly evolved brain is going to ask us to do 
But that doesn't mean that it's the best choice. It doesn't mean it's the way that we have to go. It doesn't mean that it's the way that's going to get us to where we want to be. What it means is that the brain is a biological organ that is just going off of thousands or millions of years of programming about how to survive. And those those standards, those environments that it learned in no longer apply now. And we are still letting our brains use us to accomplish its purpose and what it thinks it needs to do. And this is why so many people feel stuck in their lives and being able to create goals and go after them in their life because we're letting our brains use us and letting it use this old biological wiring, this old programming to run us through these cycles of completely dysfunctional behavior in the current environment in which we live. And the role of telling our brain what we want it to think about, what we want it to focus on, and what we want it to believe is one that we're not being taught to take. And that's what I'm here to show you guys how to do, is that we actually can take on that role. Where we're like, yes, I see you, brain. I see what you're doing over here. I get that you're afraid. I get that you think that this is the best route possible. And I see why you want that. I don't hate you for it. There's nothing wrong with you for it. But here's what you're thinking and here's the reality. Here's what we can do, though. And we can approach having a brain from this way. And, and forcing our brain to get out of its cycle of choosing to push things down into the lower brain because it wants to be lazy because it thinks we need to conserve energy. We're like, hey, look, we don't need to conserve energy anymore. We've got plenty of it. As a matter of fact, many of us have plenty of it stored all around our bones and our muscles. We don't even need to go outside of our bodies to get that, that extra energy source. It's just all over us. But then on top of that, we, have a, we don't have a lack of abundance of food available to us. There are very few people in this world that are starving to death today. And even them, there is enough food on this planet for us to feed them, but we're never going to get it to them if we don't stop being these urge-driven, brain-driven beings and start being the beings that drive our brains and start figuring out, hey, we don't need all of this food. Why in the world is it being hoarded in these parts of the world and these parts of the world aren't getting any? Well, the reason why is because we're just, we're acting with our base instincts, with what our brain is telling us to do, which is eat, 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 get comfortable, 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 you know? We're not even thinking about the fact that we don't need this much food. Why are we producing this much food in these countries when these other countries over here have people starving to death? We don't need the food here. How much food waste do we have? None of us are even thinking about this because we're so busy trying to escape discomfort and following the urges of our brain. So what, what I'm here to tell you is that we are beings that have a brain and we have the ability to take on the role of telling our brain what we want it to focus on, what we want it to think about, and what we want to believe about the world around us. Otherwise, the brain's going to tell you what it thinks you should believe based on its negativity bias and based on, you know, how that has affected how you've experienced life before and therefore the interpretations you've made about how to show up and make decisions now in your life. And if you don't take that role of charge with your brain, it will keep doing this to you for the rest of your life. You have to choose to take charge here. That is the goal. And yes, you can, because your brain is not you. I know many of, many of you feel like your brain is you. Trust me, I've been there. I know what that feels like. I'm here to promise you, your brain is not you, okay? Your brain is an organ that you get to use. It's a powerful tool. But right now, it's using you to do some really ineffective, really inefficient, really dysfunctional things in the world because it's asking you to do these things from experiences that happened millions of years ago, okay? So there we have it. So when it comes to making decisions about our health, let's bring it back to this week's topic. When we want to do this in an authentic way, the brain will want to avoid this. The brain will want to look for quick fixes and already laid out quote unquote how to guides because that seems like, oh, I don't have to think as much there. That saves energy. That's good. Then I, and also if it doesn't work, I can just blame it on the guide. I can blame it on the person and then just go back to the, the things that I did before and say, oh, see, yep, I'm broken. Something's wrong with me. Guess I just better get comfortable and keep eating food or keep not exercising or keep doing this because there's no point in trying to care for my health. It's too restrictive. It's too hard. It's, you know, I don't, it's, I don't want to live in a prison. I want to just enjoy life. You know, all these excuses that people make for why they're not caring for their health when the reality is that they have desires for how they want to care for their health, but they're not doing it in an authentic way because they're not thinking about what that would actually mean because they're letting their brain use them. So the problem here when it comes to looking for these quick fixes and these already laid out how-to guides is that this means we're leaving behind authenticity, which is the application of our true core values, our sensitivities, and our life purpose into the decisions that we make. And at this point in time, we're talking about with our health. 
So we leave that behind for energy efficiency's sake, when we allow the brain to convince us that what we want is to just look for what other people did and compare ourselves to them, feel guilt and shame about how we're taking care of ourselves because this is a familiar, comfortable path for the negativity bias of our brain and the looking for what is wrong part of the brain, that software that's always running that it thinks is keeping us safe. So this is a familiar path to feel guilt and shame and have that be our, our motivator for, for creating change. And Guys, go back and listen to all of my previous episodes and you'll hear why using guilt and shame does not ever work when it comes to making decisions about changing something in our life. But that's a topic for another day. So, but this this path of, of slipping into guilt and shame once we compare ourselves to other people is a very familiar and comfortable path that the brain can take. It doesn't require much energy from it. And then what we do once we're there is we look for someone else's quick fix or how-to guide so that we can hurry up and get ourselves away from that feeling of shame and guilt that we're experiencing by comparing ourselves to other people because we want to feel like we're good enough. And then we try and get away from that feeling of comparing and using judgments of conditional worth and... We just kind of like launch ourselves out into nowhere. We have no idea why we're going there, what we actually want, what we're heading towards. We get out into, into the middle of no, nowhere land and we're like, why am I here? This is really uncomfortable. This is awkward. I don't know what I'm doing here. Gosh, I feel like an idiot. Oh, wait, there's those habits right over there. That's right. We're familiar with that. We're used to judging ourselves there. We know how to handle it. We can stay alive there. That's probably safer. Let's go back to that. So this is the cycle that I see people stuck in. And most of the times people don't realize that this is actually the cycle that they're in. It's happening at such a subconscious level. People are like, oh, no, that's not happening to me. That's not what's going on. But then usually when I get them to sit down and have a conversation with me and I start talking to them about it, they're like, oh, crap, that is what's going on. Because, again, remember, the brain is trying to push everything into the subconscious part of the brain because that's where things can happen quickly with less energy. So the brain doesn't want you to realize even what it's doing in the background. It doesn't want you to pay attention to that because you, then you'd use more energy to think about it. So what I do is I get people to sit down and have conversations about it to where it comes up into their conscious brain. And then all of a sudden they start to see the patterns and realize that is exactly what I'm doing. That is exactly what they are doing. So here's what it is. Here's what this comes down to. What we want to do, because that's what we want to talk to, about today. What we want to be doing here is to make decisions based in our authenticity of how we genuinely desire to look at and care for our health. And I'm not talking about these false want-tos of the brain that stem from urges for this desire for comfort and certainty. I'm talking about true desires that are based in life purpose and authentic values. I see this whole entire, you know, emergence of this self-care industry branch that's all about like, you know, indulgence and comfort and immediate gratification and pampering. And, and this has become the, the modern social self-image or the modern social image of what self-care is about. And my friends, I'm here to tell you that that is a bunch of bullshit. That is not self-care. Sometimes self-care feels very icky. It feels difficult. It feels uncomfortable. It feels strenuous. It feels like, oh my God, why am I doing this? But you'll also know why you're doing it, so you'll have the answer to that question. So I'm here to tell you, when I talk about making the genuine decisions, about the genuine desires to look for and care about our health, I'm not talking about the, oh yeah, I just want to lay in bed and eat macaroons all day because that's so comfortable and I'm just, self-care, look at me, I love myself, I love my body just the way it is, and oh, Netflix and chill, and you know, look at me, self-love, self-care, laying here on my comfortable bed with the TV and my macaroons and my ice cream and my potato chips. That, my friends, is not the kind of, that, that's not the, the authentic, genuine desire for for health care that I'm talking about. Those are just the brain trying to get you to, to be comfortable and to sink, seek the familiar comfort of a food and to try and stay like That's you get letting your brain use its urges on you. So some examples of this would be like, like I said, staying in bed for when, when I talk about examples of people giving into these urges. So I just mentioned and I see this happen quite often. People will do things like stay in bed and rest for their health when they had things planned for the day. And I want to say, first of all, there are situations in which, yes, staying in bed and resting for your health would be relevant. Like when you're genuinely sick, if you have the flu, if you have a cold, if you have an injury that needs to heal. 
But how often do you see other people or do you find yourself, because I see this happening all the time, doing something like this? People overschedule themselves with a bunch of non-genuine yeses. And you might want to go back and listen to my episode where I talk about genuine yeses and genuine noes and how to give genuine noes so that we have space for genuine yeses. Because a lot of people are giving non-genuine, inauthentic yeses to activities that they don't really want to agree to, but they're trying to people please. Topic for another day. So what I see is people overscheduling themselves with a bunch of non-genuine yes activities that they agreed to. And then what they do is they feel tired and overwhelmed. So they decide, oh, self-care, woohoo. And then what they do is for their health, they choose to stay home, lay in bed, watch Netflix, and eat comfort food. Here's what I want to say about this. That is not an authentic choice for your health. That is you trying to escape the life that you have created for yourself by being in the act of people-pleasing constantly and not learning where to say genuine no's. That is not self-care. That is not caring for your health. That is you putting a Band-Aid on a bullet wound. That is you avoiding looking at the real problem. Now, here's the thing. I'm not saying when you feel overwhelmed and tired from saying too many yeses that staying home is a no-go. But here's the thing. Staying home can be an authentic decision for your health if you have truly fatigued your body to the point that it's affecting your health. But then also, if you just want to use this time to take a look at your life and the decisions that you're making and why this can also be a, an authentic decision for your genuine health. But if you're just using this time to damage your body even further by eating a bunch of comfort food and laying around in bed instead of doing something that would be good for your body, which like if you're sick, genuinely laying in bed would be a good idea to take care of your body. Or, you know, if you have an injury, something like that, you know, but doing something good for your body, like Maybe having a tea or something that's anti-inflammatory instead of a junk food. Or maybe having something that would, that would give your body the nutrients that it needs that would, that would help it to, to heal from the fatigue, from the overwhelm, from the injury, from the sickness, instead of stuffing it full of macaroons, potato chips, ice cream, and your favorite junk foods that, that give you comfort, your favorite salty snacks, your favorite sweets, whatever it might be. So taking the time to stay home, maybe going for a light walk, doing some stretching, having food that serves your body and nourishes it while you rest it, and then doing something to better your current course of action in life, which led you to this place right now where you have said too many yeses to too many things that were not true yeses for you. So think of activities like journaling about your thoughts and feelings about why you're saying yes to so many things, why you feel like you need to say yes to so many things that are not actually a genuine yes for you, and why you're not saying no when it's actually a no. And also, not saying no is counted as saying yes, by the way. If you don't say no when it's a no, that's also a yes. That's saying yes where you didn't actually genuinely mean to say yes. So maybe an activity like looking at your planning methods and seeing how it is, how it is that you've been scheduling that's led you to this point. And taking an opportunity to look at how maybe you could do this differently in the future to avoid getting yourself back into this position. This would be making a decision that is genuinely for your health, for the betterment of your body, for the betterment of your life versus, you know, giving into the brain's urge to just be like, oh, well, this is uncomfortable. Life sucks. I feel overwhelmed and fatigued and tired right now. So let's just go lay in bed and eat junk food. That sounds like a great idea. That'll feel comfortable. And then you'll be ready for life tomorrow. But then when you return to life, guess what? You're returning to the same life that got you there in the first place, so you'll just end up back there. And cycling through this more frequently and more frequently and more frequently, and needing more and more comfort and junk food at the end of every workday or at the end of every day to try and buffer away all of the inauthentic guesses that you've made yourself show up and do. Meanwhile, you're seething with resentment on the inside because you can't say no when you actually want to say no, and therefore you can't say yes to the things that you genuinely actually want to say yes for that would get you closer to the life that you want to be doing, that you want to be living. So what we want When it comes to our health, we want to be making decisions based in what we truly want for the health of our bodies, our minds, and life, and aligning those with our life purpose, our values, and our sensitivities. We want to genuinely look at the logistic factors here too, and how these align with our values, purpose, and sensitivities. And what I mean here is this. So if we're talking about weight loss, how much weight do you actually want to use, and why do you want that? And I'm not talking about telling me why some magazine article told you why you should want to weigh a certain amount according to your height or, you know, your age, whatever. I want to know what weight you would want to be at and why that weight is good for you. 
even if no one else ever sees you at that weight, if you if, uh, at that weight, if you were to live on an island and never come in contact with a single other person on this planet, what weight would you feel best at in your body? Where your body feels alive, where your body feels energetic, where it feels like you can do the activities that you want to do. You can show up for yourself and have the energy, have the vitality, have the strength that you want to have to do the things that you enjoy doing in your life. When we talk about goals related to exercise, why is it that you want to exercise? In what way do you want to exercise? What's the method? And for how long do you want to do this? Why is this important for you? Why is that method the best method for you? I'm talking about looking at stuff like this. When we talk about eating habits, we can talk about how much food do you want to eat in a day? How much is enough for you? How much is too much? And how does this serve your health goals? What kind of foods do you want to consider to be food that you will actually eat and why? What foods feel good in your body and why? How do those foods help serve your purpose and goals that you genuinely want in life? These are the kind of logistic decisions that I'm talking about looking at in, a, in an authentic way that aligns with our purpose, our values, and our sensitivities. And here's what I want to say about this. I know that this can feel confusing. Trust me, after a decade of working with people on their health goals, I know that this can feel very confusing. And simply, just one factor here, just considering and, and factoring in the staggering amount of scientific evidence or the scientific literature or not so scientific literature, and I'm talking about like magazines and stuff that people read or articles that they read on Instagram or Facebook, the staggering amount of this that is available to us online and in books all over the place, all telling us about our health and our bodies and what is best for them. I myself, my friends, because I, you know, I was a personal trainer, nutrition specialist first, I have entire bookshelves, plural, that are full of books by authors who have spent their life working and researching in the fields of science surrounding human health. And my head literally hurts sometimes when I think about all of the thousands of research studies done in the areas of exercise or nutrition when it comes to human health or research surrounding sleep. Every scientist seems to have a line of research and an opinion of how to interpret it and what they're looking for when they're researching and looking for how they're going to interpret it. They have ideas about what to research next to prove theories that they create from interpreting data from previous research that they've either read or conducted themselves. Science is this chaotically beautiful, constant seeking process, my friends. And I love science. I love it. I mean, I, I will continue buying books like this because I love reading about this. But the difference is, is how I approach it. What I think the issue is here is that for the average person, most people don't understand the intricacies of research, of research ethics, of interpretation of data, of statistics. And we could go on and on here. It can become so easy for the average person who doesn't understand these things to feel swallowed up in the research and feel like the option that, to, to take care of your health that exists is to spend every waking second of every day trying to get things perfectly right to care for your health. Or the other option is to just say, screw it, this is way too much. I'll never be able to get it right, so I might as well just, quote unquote, enjoy life, and whatever happens to my body happens, and I'm going to complain about it as it falls apart because I'm just a victim to my body, you know? I can't, I can't make any decisions for it. And he, what I'm here to say is that neither route is empowered or intentional, and it definitely isn't authentic. Authenticity is based in true desire, which is based in purpose. And since objective perfection, especially when it comes to this area, is not even able to be comprehended because, my friends, science is constantly learning. It's constantly learning. What we thought we knew 20 years ago about how to care for health has completely changed. 20 years from now, it will have completely changed too. So objective perfection here cannot be achieved as a human. So that's definitely not someone's purpose in life, to have to get things objectively perfect with their health. And giving up in frustration because what is the point is not based in purpose either. It's based in fear and avoidance of seeking one's authentic truth where purpose actually exists. Here's the thing about science. Science is not about getting it right. And I know that's going to, some, some people out there in the field of science are going to like be pissed off about me saying this, but here's the thing. Science is not about getting it right. It's not. Because if it was about getting it right, then we haven't done science yet. We haven't done it yet because we've never gotten it right. When we think we have it right, we learn something else. Science is a quest or it's a journey and it is constant. It can point to us or point us to how we understand things currently and how we can therefore explore that 
and how we're looking at it and what that could possibly mean and therefore how we could possibly interpret the results of that exploration. It is a fascinating thing to read about. There's so much guidance and inspiration available in science. Where I see a lot of people suffering when it comes to science is believing that there is a right or a wrong when it comes to science. And that there isn't anything left to question. If it's in a textbook, that means it's right, and there's nothing to question there. There's nothing left to explore. It's just a fact. It's what's true, and that's the end of the story. But yet, we have to update textbooks every two to three years. Why? Because we're constantly learning new things. Because the more we explore, the more we know, the more we realize we don't know. That is science. It's not about getting it quote-unquote right. Science will never get it right, because when we get it right, there's always more to explore. I've told you this in the past several episodes. What we comprehend in life is 0.0000000004%, actually less than that, of reality. So science is human's way of trying to interpret life, and we're interpreting it through that very limited lens. So there's always so much more data out there for us to find. And every time we find new data, it changes the way we look at the old data. It changes the way we, we approach the old data. So science isn't about getting it right. Science is about constantly questioning and looking for answers that will never be fully, fully objectively found as being right. Okay? So I think for the majority of people, where we can start releasing a lot of pressure here is this idea with our health that, we, that, that when we look at science, we have to use it to get things, we have to make the right decision. No. The only right decision is the one that is authentic for you, that is in your genuine wants for how you want to take care of your body, the health of your life, the health of your relationships, the health of your, your mental health, all of that according to what your purpose, your true desires, your values, your sensitivities in life are. That is what is quote unquote right. And it won't be right for someone else. That doesn't make it wrong. So where I see people going about using science to inform their health decisions, though, is to try and figure out, according to the research, what is this quote-unquote right way, and therefore what they quote-unquote should do for their health. And this, my friends, is not the path of authenticity. But here's the thing. We also don't want to throw out this amazing resource of science. We don't want to throw it out entirely because it is a resource, and it's a rich one at that. It is a huge resource for guidance and inspiration when we can look at it in a way that is that it is as subjective as it actually is. And that we can interpret it in a lot of different ways. And sure, we can listen to how certain scientists are interpreting it. And we can feel how those line up with or don't line up with our values or beliefs. We can feel questions about our, our desires, our values, and beliefs coming up. And we can expand our view of our values and our beliefs in, in that inspiration. But my friends, science isn't going to tell you how to get it right. It's not going to. It can't. Okay? So the question is, how do we use this resource in a way where we are still authentic to our purpose, values, and sensitivities? I would say the place to start, where we need to start, is to recognize where you might be using scientific literature, or like I said, not so scientific literature, think things like men's health magazines, or Glam, or L or Vogue, or whatever magazine you read that article in that was some journalist interpretation of science, or some interview that they did, or it was just their opinion about like health and how you should quote unquote be taking care of it. So start by recognizing that these sources are never a source of what you should do for your health. That, first and foremost, is important. That's where we need to start. Here is why. Because these articles are telling you a suggestion. They're telling you a possibility. They're telling you what something seems to show to them. But when it comes to our health, the final say and what we want from it what we want to believe about it, how we want to care for it, and why. It's ours entirely. It's not anyone else's. And we're going to talk next week about why it's so important for us to understand that. Why it's so important for us to apply this. Like, but for today, it's, it's, I want you to recognize what it looks like when we start making decisions that are based in authenticity. So first of all, it's about bringing those decisions back to our authentic purpose our authentic values and sensitivities. I'm going to give you an example in my own life here. 
So I told you all last week about my experience of of going to the gym and trying to prove that I was man enough or trying to prove that I was a respectable personal trainer by getting bigger muscles, by getting leaner, by getting more ripped. I would read all the time, my friends. I would read scientific research. I would read magazine articles about the importance of exercise and muscle tissue and how growing muscle tissue shows positive impact on health and longevity. I would read all of these sorts of articles. I could go on and on about the the kinds of articles that I would look for. I would use all of this to create this idea or reinforce this idea in my head that this is what I should be doing because health, right? And health to me meant looking the part. Forget that I was in pain, forget that I was losing sleep, forget that I was having issues with my digestion. I knew what most personal trainers look like and that personal trainers are supposed to be healthy. And I knew what the respected personal trainers look like. And I knew that the scientific literature said that muscle growth is important for longevity and health. So muscle means health, right? I also knew that these bodybuilders who were going to these trainers were looking for trainers who looked ripped, who looked ripped meaning that they had very little body fat, so their muscles looked really defined. So I looked at the research on this and found research indicating that lower body fat percentage showed advantageous effects in the body long term when it came to metabolism, health, and longevity. So if you look at what I was doing here with both of these decisions, and there were many more, but these are just two examples of decisions that I was making. I was looking for research to prove to myself what I wanted to believe about how I should look. I already had an idea of how I should look, and I was looking for research to back why that was healthy. It was based in me comparing myself to other people and believing that I was somehow coming up short in my worthiness in comparison to these people. And that's the really thing that the thing that's really interesting about scientific literature, or even just research itself. This thing it's called confirmation bias. And basically what it means is that we can find exactly what we are looking for when we're looking for it. We have a reticular activating system. We tell our brain what to look for, and the brain cannot help but to look for it. We do this on social media. We do it in how we look at the world around us. We do it in how we look at our bodies. We do it in how we look at our bodies in comparison to other people. We do it in how we choose to interpret events in our life. We are constantly seeking evidence that what we already believe is true, because then that means we're right and we're less likely to die. Remember, that's the brain. The brain has this this desire for that. So in this case, what I was doing, I was believing that muscular lean men were more deserving of the title of being a man, and they made more respectable personal trainers, which were healthy. And my worth was tied up into my ability to be a good personal trainer. That's what, what, you know, defined my worth in college was my knowledge of, of how to take care of the human body and how much I had studied and taking care of ourselves and taking care of our health. And then that's why I was hired in my job. So my worth was all tied up in my ability to be good at this. And if I wasn't good at that, then I wasn't worthy anymore. My worth was tied up in that. And so I needed to prove that I was worthy of that title. I needed to prove that I was good enough. And I wasn't looking like the other quote-unquote successful personal trainers all around me, according to the standard of, of success that was also not authentic for me. So for what I was doing was I felt like I needed to make decisions about my health to gain value, to gain respect by trying to look a certain way to other people, trying to get them to look at me in a certain way. None of my goals for my health were based in my values. They weren't based in my purpose. They weren't based in my sensitivities in life. They were all about what I should be doing. And the should was based in what other people would think about me, how they would choose to see me as a man and as a personal trainer. My goals were also about me having this idea of myself that I hated or I was disgusted with, that I didn't respect, that I didn't love. This idea that I was this skinny, unmanly, unrespectable boy. And my goals were designed to get me away from that belief about myself into a place where I would finally be allowed to feel about myself what I really wanted to feel and what was already true about me, but I wasn't letting myself feel it, which was to feel like I was a respectable, fit man who knew how to take care of my health and my body, and I could help others do the same. I could help others find their way to do it. But I wasn't allowed, or at least I wouldn't, I thought I wasn't allowed to believe that about myself until the right number of the right kind of people believed that about me and validated it for me. Which, of course, would never happen because no matter how many people tried validating it for me, I could always find that someone who didn't. And then it was their respect, their validation that I needed in order to feel good enough. And the loop was just endless over and over with this. But here's the crazy thing here, though. 
I told you all last week that I took my goals for my health and I brought them back to authenticity in my life. And what is so crazy is that the goals themselves didn't change much at all. Yet, I show up completely different for them now because I brought them back to authenticity. So let me tell you what I mean here. The goals themselves, the what, the, the, getting, the, the going to the gym, the working out, the gaining strength, and therefore my muscles are going to grow too, stayed fairly close to what they were before as far as how much I wanted to exercise and what kind of exercising I wanted to do and what I wanted my body to feel like for me and its ability to move and its ability to do things. But my why... My why changed everything. Authenticity is about applying purpose, values, and sensitivities to these goals. And all three of these are about a why that is authentic for you. And for me, what happened was I was able to apply my goals to a why that was authentic for me. And once I found the why that I wanted to care for my health and saw that what I wanted to do and and why I wanted to do it, it wasn't based in what other people would think or what kind of attention I would get from other people. But it was based in what I genuinely wanted and why. And then the way I showed up for my health felt unstoppable. It felt unstoppable because I had a reason why. So no matter what happened in the circumstances around me, no matter what people were saying around me, no matter how people were looking at me and my interpretation of how they would look at me, no matter you know if I was tired, if I had an injury, I was still unstoppable in showing up for my health because it was based in a why, not a what. So growing my muscles and strengthening them, it was no longer about what kind of looks of approval I would get from a certain community of people in the realm of fitness and health. Although I probably do get looks from them and I get attention from them, but this is simply a byproduct now. It's not the goal because the why became my goal. It became about expressing freedom. Freedom to do what I wanted to do with my body. I wanted to be able to climb a mountain and to be able to pull myself up onto something to see a view of openness and vastness of the world to remind me just how small and limited my view can be here on the ground. And if I just shift the elevation of that view a little bit, then I would see things completely different. I wanted to be able to experience that. I wanted more activities that I could say yes to because I wanted to instead of saying no because of not being sure if my body could handle it. I wanted to have the freedom to take an extended weekend and to use it to go completely off-grid with a heavy backpack and hike into the middle of nowhere, set up camp, be in nature 1,000% surrounded and absorbed by it. I wanted my body to be strong and fit and able enough to say yes to opportunities like this, to that freedom. The freedom to experience is what my fitness became about. And guess what? When I'm no longer physically capable of hiking up on a mountain, my health is still about freedom. And I can still create that in other ways in my health and how I show up in my life and what I'm capable of doing. Those aren't the only ways. Those are the ways that I want to do it now because I can. But those aren't the goal. Those cans, those what's are not the goal. The goal is to keep creating this freedom for myself and how I care for my health. Aligning with how I care for my health with freedom. And yeah, you could argue, oh, you have freedom to eat whatever you want. Well, you know what? I argue that I do get to eat whatever I want. I get to eat whatever I want that feels good enough in my body to allow me to do the things that I want to do. I have the freedom to eat those things and to say no to the other things. I have that freedom. I have that freedom to say no to eating this food over here because I want to say yes to this food over here. And I'm going to eat that instead because that feels good for me. That helps fuel the things that I want to do with my body. This doesn't. This actually makes it me have to say no to these things over here because it doesn't feel good in my body. I feel bloated. I feel fatigued. I feel icky. I feel achy. I feel heavy. So no, I want want to genuinely say no to these things that some people call food. I'm not going to call those food. I have the freedom to say, these are what I call food. And therefore, this is what I'll eat because this is when I feel good is when I eat these things. That's the kind of freedom. It was about freedom. And there were other aspects of my health goals that changed because of uh, my why changed. And and then my health goals became based in these authentic whys. But I'm going to stop here for today. I'm going to stop here for today. Next week, we're going to pick up here. I've already told you now that, that what changed with authenticity. So what we're looking for here is the why when it comes to health and the goals for it. And that changing to a why that is authentically aligned with values with purpose, 
and with sensitivities, that changes the game completely and how you show up for your health because it changed it for me and it's changed it for everyone that I've worked with in this way. So next week, I'm going to talk with you all about some more of these goals and how changing to authentic choices for my health changed how I was showing up for for those goals because my why changed and because the reason why I was doing these things was was the goal, not the what. Not the, not the validation from other people. But also next week, I want to talk about why it is that this is so important for us to look at and take action on. Why is this so important to look at? So what if we can, if we can make authentic health choices? Why is that so important for us? I want to talk to you all about this next week. And the reason why might be a little bit surprising for you. The reason why I may even feel a little bit uncomfortable at first to think about. Trust me, it, it, it might for a lot of you. But in the end... This is so freeing, it's so empowering, and it's so full of compassion for ourselves. So we're going to talk about that next week. Last week, we focused on what it looks like when health goals are inauthentic and how to recognize that. This week, we talked about shifting that approach to one of authenticity and what that means. And we started looking at why why we do this and why this is important. And it has to do with the why for our health goals, our authentic whys and therefore how we're going to show up for them. And next week, we're going to jump deeper into this, how authenticity changes our why for our health goals and why this is something that we want to put into action in our lives. So what I want is until next week, I want my listeners to begin considering something. If you look at your health goals now and recognize inauthenticity there, and I want you to go back and listen to last week's episode to hear how you can start to recognize that, then I want you to begin to question and consider over the next week. What your why is for those health goals. I want you to begin to question that and consider it. What is the reason why you are going after them? How do you feel when you look at this reason why? Is it a feeling of frustration? A feel of needing to hurry up and change? A feeling of, I can't wait to get there so I can finally feel better about myself? Is it a feeling of, I can't wait to have these people feel this way about me and look at me in this way? I want you to think about this and how you show up for your health goals because of these feelings. And how you choose to plan your journey for those health goals because of these feelings. Okay? Then I want you to begin to consider something else. What might feel different if you aligned your goals with an authentic purpose of yours? And authentic values that are yours? What might feel different for you here? And how might the way you plan your journey in your health, how might that be different? Some of you may not feel clear on your authentic purpose or values. This is the very first thing that I dive into with my clients when they come to work with me. So I'm here to help you with that. We can do this either one-on-one as a coach, or I have an exercise that that, that I sell that includes two half coaching sessions with me that you can purchase and do them on your own to begin to get a, a clearer picture of purpose and values in your life. And you can head over to, if, if that sounds interesting for you, just head over to my website. It's linked in the show notes. It's www.slch.ch. It's not .com, it's .ch, okay? slch.ch. Head over to my website. There's a link there to set up a free discovery call with me. So if you're interested in any of this and want to find out more about the details of maybe how you can get clearer on your life purpose and your values, head over there, set up your free discovery call. The discovery call, like I said, it's 100% free, free of obligation and free of it costing you any money, okay? So you can schedule the call. It's simply, all it's there for is to bring clarity and support and making a decision about coaching for you and how you want to show up for this, how you want to get clarity here. Okay. That's all that call is for. So for those of you who've been through this exercise with me before though, this one that I'm talking about, or those of you who may have worked through something similar with another coach, or in some way you've, you've defined your purpose or values for yourself. What I want you to do is take this coming week to think about these questions that I mentioned just, just a, a minute ago, when it comes to why your health goals are your goals and therefore how you're showing up for them, and how might it be different if you aligned your why with an authentic purpose and value, or authentic purpose and values. I want you to think about all of this, okay? And next week, we're going to talk about it. We're going to talk a little bit more in depth about it, just how this changes and why this is so important, okay? That's all I have for you this week. I look forward to sharing next week's episode with you all because there's there's some really cool content in there, so I'm really looking forward to to next week's episode, make sure you tune in. Stay tuned for part three. 
But until then, get out there. Get out there and let authenticity be your guide in every part of your life, including your health. All right? I love you all. Ciao. Hey, thank you for listening in this week. I hope you enjoyed the content of this episode. If you did, please subscribe or follow this podcast to receive the newest episodes every week as I bring them to you here on the Connect Your Health to Life coaching channel. Ratings, reviews, and comments are always appreciated. These allow me to know more of what my listeners would like in the podcast and allow for more people who may be searching for a podcast just like this one to find the Connect Your Health to Life coaching channel. If you would like more information about me and the work that I do with my clients one-on-one, then please visit my website at www.slch.ch. Again, that is www.slch.ch. You can also find me on social media on Instagram at SethLusk underscore coaching. Again, that is SethLusk underscore coaching. And on Facebook in my free Facebook group community called A Healthy Life Connection. We would love to have you in the group, and it's only three membership questions that you have to answer to join. And again, it's entirely free. And if you need any further information or just want to say hello, feel free to send me an email directly at slusk.health at slch.ch. Again, that is slusk.health at slch.ch. Thank you again so much for listening, and I look forward to our next time together. Ciao.